Yeah, you guys ready to get cranking this morning? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing on his love. Yeah, bless the Lord. That is so true and so right and so good. Uh, fear's a powerful, powerful motivate, demotivator and killer in our life, right? We don't do a lot of things because we're afraid to do them, and fear dominates our life. And only the Lord can break that fear off of us, you know? I don't know if you've experienced this or not, but if you've ever had the fear broken out of your life, it is a tremendous releasing experience to you because we all are subject to fear and anxieties and issues and hurts and problems and all of those things. And we've been in a series the last few weeks called uh, Handling Life's Hurts. And we've looked at several of them. Uh, we looked at rejection, which all of us have suffered, being rejected by others, family members, people you love, even strangers. I mean, rejection is one of those common issues of life where people just uh, refuse to accept us or receive us in any way. And what did Jesus teach us about rejection? That we needed to just shake the dust off. And you just have to just shake the dust off your feet and move on. Because if you try to drag the dust from the past into the future, you're going to drag rejection and issues and problems and anxieties and all of those things along with you. So you just have to let it go and uh, shake the dust off. The Lord gave us permission. Don't get all down in the dumps and feel like you're a failure in life and want to commit suicide and be carrying that load of guilt all around with you. Just shake the dust off and move on. And then we dealt with anger and we found out that anger was really a warning signal. You know, it's like a on your dash in your automobile when your car go, gets hot or when it go, gets low on gas or whatever your car is equipped with, there will be a little, little light that comes on or a little signal that comes on. This, uh, and it's a warning signal. And, uh, and it's telling you, okay, it's, there's a problem here yeah, and you need yeah. to check this problem out. It's gonna, you're going to be walking here before you know it, so check it out. Well, anger is a warning signal because it's really caused by lots of things. And we looked at the anger iceberg and just, you know, all of the stuff. Like an iceberg, anger's on top and everything that causes it is underneath the water. And so uh, the part that's underneath is way, way bigger than the part that's on top. So uh, deal with anger this way. And, of course, all those uh, that information and message are available. Then we dealt with disappointment and we found out that uh, the most disappointing things in life happen when, when we're disappointed by others. And we learned that when we are disappointed by others, we don't curse it. And I didn't say cuss it. I said don't curse it. <laughs> curse it means to you know, pronounce judgment against it. Don't, don't curse it. Don't nurse it. Don't rehearse it. You disperse it, All give right. it to God, and let God reverse it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's a, that's, one, that's, a, that's a little ditty for you. And then we dealt last week with how to stay calm in a crisis and uh, went with the Apostle Paul out on the Mediterranean Ocean in a big storm called Eurachlodon came in life. How many of you have ever faced some big storms in life? Yeah. yeah. Now you say, brother, I know what it is to face a storm. And and of course, this storm shipwrecks the ship and does all kind of things. And, and we learned how to uh, respond when, you know, storms cause us to drift. Storms cause us to discard things that we need in better days. You know, uh, we just start throwing stuff out of our lives. And life just, I mean, it just is more confusing as if somehow the answer to uh, drifting would be more confusion. What we need is really way less confusion. And then despair, hopelessness, you know, caused by storms in our life. And what do you do when you get in a storm? Well, you drop some anchors, you know, the presence of God, the power of God. Anyway, that was last week. Well, today we're going to look at a very familiar passage of Scripture, a story, really, a parable uh, that's shared in Luke chapter 15. How many of you have ever read Luke chapter 15? You've read the whole chapter? The whole chapter is just one big parable, by the way. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it is. And, the, and Jesus tells this one giant parable with three applications, three analogies. One is a lost lamb, a lost sheep, and the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes, finds the one, brings it back, everybody rejoices. The next one is a, a widow who loses a coin. And she sweeps her house and searches everywhere. And when she finds the coin... She calls her friends, and they come in, and they're just re they rejoice with her because she's found that which was lost. And then uh, the last analogy is the parable of the lost son, where 
the son leaves home and dad, you know, he's gone and then he comes back. He, we call him the prodigal. Now, that's not what the Bible calls him. The Bible doesn't say this is the parable of the prodigal son. That's what we've named it because prodigal, prodigal means to spend excessively and wastefully. That's what the word means. So if you spend excessively and wastefully, you are a prodigal. But uh, the term, and if you look it up in Merriam-Webster's dictionary, uh, online, by the way, look, look it up in there, you'll find a definition for prodigal son or prodigal daughter. I mean, it's become such a common word and a common phrase and a common, common concept that the dictionary even has a definition for what it means to be a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. It, uh, it, it means uh, one who leaves their parents to do things that the parents do not approve of, then feel sorry and return home. That's what a prodigal son is. They leave home in order to do things that they know their parents don't approve of. That's why they leave, because they don't want to obey the rules. This place is too small for me, you know. I want to do my own thing. Yeah. But then later, they, they see the error of their way. They feel sorry that they did that, and then they return home. So that's the prodigal. So Luke 15, uh, there's a parable about many things. And then the last little uh, analogy at the end is really unnoticed by most people, actually. Uh, it, it's the parable of lost fellowship. It's the older brother who doesn't come in and celebrate. And that's really the whole point of Luke 15, actually. But... Uh, but the parable of the prodigal son has many applications, and it just has lots of ways you can go. It, it applies to lots of things in life. There are, there are many things that you, can, that you can lay alongside the parable of the prodigal son, and it can teach you some things about how to handle these things and how to look at these things in life. Because all of us, grandparents, parents, uh, associated uh, concerned people... <laughs> In, in, in the lives of others uh, have all experienced um, someone who grows out of our control, let's just say it that way, who, 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 who somehow uh, has come to the point in life, either by age or by, by nature, uh, where they don't want to be part of the family anymore. They don't want to be part of the home anymore. They they want to go their own way, do their own thing. They don't want to obey the rules. They don't want to. They don't want to. They don't want to mom and dad hovering around them, and, and and our grandparents. And so we've all experienced that kind of issue in life. And 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 the parable of the prodigal son is a great story to lay alongside there. I think personally to give us a little relief about this thing, to comfort us in some ways, to show us uh, what Jesus says that we should do when this kind of thing happens in life. Now, it doesn't tell us why it happens. And I know everybody in here would love to know, why does this happen? Why, why do some families experience uh, the kids leaving angry, hot, hostile? Uh, I mean, even good families, godly families. I'm going to tell you something, and this may be a dirty little secret. But, uh, man, spiritual people have just as much problem with this as everybody else does. And I'm telling you, the bigger they are, usually the more problem they have with this. And the only reason you don't know it is because you don't know them. If you knew them, you'd know how much problem they had. And you'd say, my Lord, we need to pray for them. They are having tremendous problems. And so great. I mean, the Bible is filled, even filled, with stories and illustrations of great spiritual people that have prodigal children in life. And so certainly none of us are immune to this. And if you're a young parent right now, <laughs> I don't want to scare you. But, uh, you know, sooner or later, you're going to have to face some issues like these things. But grandparents who are rearing children, I have never seen a time when more grandparents are rearing children than they are now. As a matter of fact, I'm not so, uh, I don't think it would be so far off to say that more grandparents are re rearing children than parents are now. The parents may be, you know, hundreds of miles away. They live in some other part of the country and the, parents, the children are shipped down with grandparents. And man, I'm going to tell you something. As a grandparent, as a grandparent myself, we've done our time. I'm just going to tell you that. You know, it's like, hey, man, no, 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 no. no. We've done our time. Uh, it's your turn to, to handle these things. And, uh, and, and as a grandparent, when you start handling children, especially when they're young, you learn one truth real quick. 
That's why God gives children to young people, you know, <laughs> because they just take such tremendous energy and strength and everything. And you're not in the generation. You don't even know what's going on. They, they can do things that you never even thought of. You never even knew existed. You don't know how to fix it. You don't even know what's happening. It's just, and just spin circles around your life, you know, and it makes life really tough. Well, you know, we all face these kind of things, and, and the Lord knew this. This is, not, this is not new. This has been happening, you know, since humans, the, the first two kids on earth were juvenile delinquents. I mean, really, Cain killed Abel, you know, out in the middle of the field, and then, you know, God put a mark in Bible. I mean, it, it, it's as old as humanity. So the Lord wants to, I think, give us a little relief about this, because I know some of you carry great guilt about it about these kind of things. I'm, I don't know why. I don't know why you do, because you can't do anything about it. What do you think you can do about it? I mean, why do you feel guilty about it? Can we admit that there are many things in life that are out of our control? Can we admit that? That we can't control everything? And so the things that are out of our control mean they're out of our control. And there are many influences that happen with young people and, and, and as teenagers grow up. I mean, there are just many things that happen. There are all kind of variables in life and influences and decisions that are made and directions that are headed in that we have absolutely no control over in life. So why should we feel guilty about this when we have, like, it's all my fault? You know, my child ran away from home, or my child, you know, got somebody pregnant and left, and, or, or some, my child, you know, was living on the streets out there selling drugs. Or, I mean, and, and, and we many times feel so guilty about this, as if we did it. It's all our fault. We should have been a better parent. We should have done better. We should have known better. Now, I'm not saying that parenting is not a skill, because it is. And the Bible will help you parent as much as possible. But there are many things that we do not have control over. And the Lord knows it, and he's going to tell us this in this parable. I'm telling you, I, I think and hope and pray that it'll have relief. Because if you're looking at me to be a parenting expert, I'm going to tell you right now, before I even preach this, I am not a parenting expert. Okay, we got y'all understand that? I am not a parenting. I know you see Justin up here on the stage, and you go, man, he's a wonderful young man, and he is. He's great. Amy gets up here, she's wonderful, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, grandkids get up here, play bass guitar, do other things like that, drums, all that kind of stuff. You see them around and all that kind of thing. But I'm going to tell you something. Nobody knows the sorrow we've seen. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows the issues. Let me, I, I, let me tell you, this, is just, this ought to just say it all. This ought to just say it all right here. Uh, when, when our children were growing up, Tanya and I, you know what our prayer was? Our prayer was, Lord, please keep our children alive until they get mature enough to make wise choices. That was, that was our prayer to them. And we have found out since they become adults, I mean, Justin's 39, Amy's 37. Uh, we found out in, in the 30s, roughly, a lot of things they did um, that we don't even want to hear about. No, 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 no. They just... <laughs> No, you didn't do that. That was, a, that was a dream you had, son. You didn't do that. <laughs> and a lot of it we knew about, uh, really, to be honest about it. But, uh, you know, you got to pick your fights a lot of times. But, but anyway, let me, read you, let me read you this passage. This passage, if you want to hear a real bad life, talk to Lawrence about his. Uh, verse, verse 11, here we go. I'm not going to confess somebody else's sin. But anyway, uh, verse 11. <laughs> Then he said, this is Jesus speaking. Jesus said, all right, let me tell you this. Let me give you this parable. Let me give you this story, this analogy. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Now, I, I don't want to strain at a gnat and swallow a camel, and this really doesn't matter about the message. But I just think it's kind of interesting to notice, you know, the last little line. So he divided to them. In other words, he, he, he not only gives the younger boy what he's going to get in inheritance, he gives the older son. He divided to them. Them's plural last time I checked, right? All right, yeah, yeah. Some people use it as a singular, ver a singular word, but it's not. It's a plural, the, to them. All right, so both boys get what they, what they you know, their inheritance, what they're going to get when dad dies, which is, you know, the boy to, for the boy to come to his dad and ask for his inheritance is just a slap in the face. It means, dad, you aren't dying fast enough. That's what it really means. I know I'm going to get an inheritance when I die, but you ain't dying fast enough, old man. Come on. Give me my stuff. I'm ready to get out of here. 
I mean, he's ready to go. He's a wild young buck bucking at the reins. He's ready to go. The farm's too small for me. I'm ready to get out of town. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with riotous living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. Now, you can understand that a Jewish boy, and I think probably most of you understand enough about Jewish customs to know that pigs are a no-no for, for Jewish people, right? You understand this. And so for a Jewish boy to even be associated with the word swine was a terrible thing. But now he's out there in the pig pen actually feeding the pigs in a pig pen somewhere, which really shows you exactly what the devil has for you. Uh, the, devil, the devil has nothing to offer you once he's finished with you. I mean, this is just a side point, all right? This is just a preaching point. But, but I just want you to notice that, that when, when the devil was through with this boy, when all of his stuff was gone, when he's used you up and used you out, and you have no more possessions and goods and talents and abilities and capabilities and response. I mean, when he's used you up, the only thing he has to offer you is the pig pen of life. He has no good. There, the devil has no happy old men. Let me just say that. And this is what happens to the boy. And you got to get out there and feed pigs. Boy, that's the best job we got for you. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. You can picture that, right? He looks down at the pig trough and says, man, I'm starving to death. That looks, that, that looks pretty good. Dad. What is that, a piece of sausage? Or what? <laughs> and no one gave him anything. No one, nobody bailed him out. None of his buddies. None of his buddies. But when he came to himself, mm -hmm. he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger at least at dad's house. Dad... Dad's a, dad's a great dad, and he feeds the servants that work for him. So if I could just be one of his servants, I would at least have something to eat. I wouldn't be wanting to eat. I'd just pig trough. So, man, I mean, hey, come on. I will arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he didn't even get to get through with his speech. What was the next line of his speech? Make me as one of your hired servants. Didn't even get to get through with his speech. But the father said to the servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Wonderful, wonderful story. Great end, great closing to that. And if, you know the, if you've read the actual rest of it, uh, you know it has a sad postscript that the boy that stayed home, the older brother, wouldn't go into the party and... Of course, the whole point of that is Jesus was saying to the Jews, that's you, that's you. You're griping about all these people that are coming to me and complaining about them. You're the older brother. You're the, you're, you're the boy that won't get happy when lost people get saved. You're the boy that won't get happy when, say, when, when troubled people get found, when troubled people get help. You're the guy that wants to keep them out there and punish them and talk about them. And you know, that's the whole point of the thing. But, but anyway, that's a whole other message. But the point is, all right, here we have a story of, of a father with two sons, and uh, great issues happen with the sons. Both of the boys have problems now. Uh, seriously, they both have problems. So, you know, don't think one of them's good and one of them's bad. The, old, the older boy, he stays home. He's the compliant son, and the, and, the, and the younger boy is the radical boy, and he's the compliant. But he's sitting there at the house. He's still got problems in his heart. While he's sitting at home, he's, 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 he's brewing all kinds of hatred and distrust and anger against his brother. It, it comes out. But this is a story, I think, about, uh, about help for us to know how to handle, what, what to do. What, what do we do when our children grow beyond our control? Because they are. 
they're going to grow beyond our control at some point in life. They're going to get out there, and that, that power struggle for control is going to come to a head, and it's going to be my way or the highway uh, sooner or later in life. All children come to that point. You know, they may, be, they, may, they may go to college, and that takes them out. They may get married. You know, they, that takes them out. Or they may, like Lawrence, 15 years old, uh, left home. I pray not. I hope not. You know, nobody would want that. As, but that happens at times. And, um, and you just, you know, got to go and, and got to get out there. May I say this to you before I even start on anything else, that if, if they are in your control, then control them. Let me say that again. Let me say that again. If they are in your control, they still at the house. They're at your control. It's your house, your rule, your live. Control them. Don't throw the rain back and let the wild horses run. Don't let them run the house and run you and run the family and run life and all that. You take control. But there will come a point where they grow beyond your control and there's going to be nothing you can do about it and you can't control it anymore. And this is... This is what Jesus, uh, one of the pictures that Jesus shows us in this passage, and I'm not a marriage expert. I, I, I love to listen to preaching, and I know that I've said this to you many times, so you know it. One of my hobbies is to listen to preaching. I love preachers. I love listening to preaching. I like all kinds of preachers. I like, I like romp and stompers. I like uh, med- educated guys. I like uh, storytellers. I like every kind of preaching you can name. And uh, there was a, uh, uh, one of the preachers I enjoyed listening to was a, pre- was a Presbyterian preacher. He, pre- he was a Presbyterian preacher for pastor for 50 years. As a matter of fact, he was an author too and wrote many, many books. Two of the most famous books he wrote uh, came out in the 70s and the early 80s, Letters to Philip and Letters to Karen, uh, letters to, to his children about what a dad would want to say to his children. They were great. I mean, well, um, bestsellers back then. But his name was Charles Shedd. And Charles Shedd shared the story, and, and I just identified with it so much. He said when he was a young pastor and he was single, that he used to have a seminar that he would preach in every church he went in, and the seminar was how to rear your children. So here he is, because, I mean, I mean, obviously nobody knows more about child rearing than somebody that doesn't have any kids, right? Somebody that's not even married, much less has any kids. I mean, don't, if you don't believe it, ask them. Matter of fact, most of them you don't even have to ask. They want to dabble in uh, whether you ask them or not, right? Let me just say something. If you don't have any, ki- any children, keep your mouth shut. How about that? Because you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. And, and if you had some children, you'd learn better than that. I'll guarantee you that. So don't be telling people what to do if you don't have children in your life because you don't know. I guarantee you. You think you do, but you don't know. You don't have a clue what it's like to have a child. Then he said when he got married, he changed his seminar title to Some Suggestions to Parents. <laughs> now, he still doesn't have any kids, but he's just married. And then he said when he had his, his, his first child, he changed his seminar title to Feeble Hints for Fellow Strugglers. <laughs> And he said, then when, he, when his children became teenagers, he quit giving the seminar altogether. <laughs> I can say amen to that, like the woman that got on the bus with six kids. Uh, you guys do know that I, I, I drive a school bus uh, now, and I'm enjoying it relatively uh, well. But um, <laughs> that's what old retired people do. But anyway, the, uh, the, uh, so I, the guy, lady gets on the bus with six kids. And the bus driver says, ma'am, uh, are these all your kids? Or, or is this a, like a class picnic? And she turns around and looks at him and she says, yep, they're all mine and this ain't no picnic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can understand. I can say, what, what, do you, what do you do with children when they grow beyond your control? Uh, there are five stages I think Jesus identifies here. Five stages from rebellion to return. Because what we're looking for is return, Right. Now, that doesn't mean they have, to, they have to come back home and stay in your basement and stuff like that. Matter of fact, some of you may be having the opposite trouble from them leaving. They're staying. And you're saying, you got to get up out of here now. I mean, you're 40 years old. Get out of the basement, you know? I mean, come on. Uh, I, that's a whole other problem and a whole other ball game. But <laughs> is that Harry back there? Oh, my goodness. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you, brother. My goodness. Praise the Lord. No, that's not Harry. That's Freddie. No, no, I called the wrong name. You know why? Because I can't see halfway. 
Not only, not only am I retired, I can't have C. I'm sorry. But anyway, praise the Lord. But, but anyway, so you may be having the opposite problem. I have really not a lot of word about that, you know, other than put their stuff outside the door and say, see you. You know, that'd be about the only. But anyway, the point is, this is about, this is about from rebellion to return. And by return, I mean repentance. I mean uh, changing the way they think. Their heart changes. Uh, life changes, and, and they think differently, and, they, and, they, and, and there's, uh, there's reconciliation and so forth. Okay, so we're going from rebellion to return. There's five stages in it. Number one, of course, obviously, the first stage, and I know in your notes uh, I wrote out, the first stage is rebellion. And um, in verse 11, uh, then he said to, his, uh, to a certain man, had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided his livelihood between his two sons. All right, every parent-child relationship comes to this point at somewhere along the line. There is a struggle for control. The reason why is because obviously when the child is born, you as a parent have 100% control, right? You decide when they get fed, when they get changed, what happens to them when they take a nap, when they lay down, whatever happens. I mean, as a young child, you have 100% control of what happens in that child's life. As the child grows, however... That power begins to transfer. And the only problem with this power transfer is that most of the time, our children want to be independent before we are ready for them to be independent. As a matter of fact, I looked up the word. Did you know that there's a mother's dictionary? Yeah, you can look it up. There's a mother's dictionary. And, there, and, and the mother's dictionary has the definition for the word independent. And, uh, and, and, it, and did, I put it, did I put that in the notes? Look at the mother. The mother's definitions for independent is how we want our children to be as long as they do everything we say. We want our children to be independent as long as they do everything else, everything we say. And that's pretty much the struggle that goes on there. And, and verse 12, where the, young, where the boy comes to his dad and says, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. I got, I've had it, uh, everything, and I'm, I'm filled up with the farm. I don't want to stay on the farm anymore. I'm tired of doing all the work on the farm. I want to get out there, and I want to live my life. So verse 12 is a classic confrontation of, uh, of wills is what it really boils down to. And the son's attitude is uh, defined by the first two words after father there in verse 12. Look at it. Father, give me. So the attitude of uh, rebellion is characterized by give me. Give me my stuff. Give me what I deserve. Give me. I mean, it's totally self-centered, right? It's totally wrapped around himself. I, 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 I'm fed up with the farm. I'm fed up with the rules. Don't, I'm fed up with the restrictions. I'm fed up with the discipline. I'm fed up with my brother. I'm fed up with everything to do with the farm. And I'm ready to get out here. Now, a side point, just to, to share with you, uh, a side point, I, I want you to know that, that rebellion is unpredictable. Because, notice, it is not the older boy that rebels. It's the younger boy that rebels. And so, you, you know, you, it's not just an age thing is what I'm talking about. I mean, it can be, it can be. Well, anyway, so the younger boy rebels. And uh, verse 13 says, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and he journeyed to a far country. And may I just say far uh, not only means in distance, but it probably means in culture. In other words, it's not only far, but it's foreign to him. It's different. It, it, it's something, you know, he's never experienced before. You, you know, it's a foreign, it's foreign to his culture, foreign to his upbringing, foreign to his life. It's exciting, man. There are flashing lights everywhere. Do you know hog pens have flashing lights on them everywhere? I mean, this as a sign. I don't know if you know that. Uh, but man, the devil has lots of hog pens. I, I don't think I've ever mentioned this to you, but, but uh, I, I grew up in a rural situation, a uh, farm. Uh, I didn't grow up actually on a farm, but we had farm animals and so forth. And I was in the country, lived on a dirt road and all that. And all of my relatives lived in real farm country. And my papa had a real, he, he, he lived in Louisville, Mississippi, and it was a real farm, had cows and big fields and pastures and everything, pigs and all that kind of stuff. When we go up there at the end of the year, my, my, my papa would do something that was really crazy, I thought. He would open the gate and let those pigs run out, run down in the woods. And I thought to myself, we're never going to see those pigs again. That's it. What Papa lost his mind. I mean, they're going to run down in the woods and they're never coming back. Well, what happened is uh, long about the, uh, the summer came and the spring and then the corn grew. And then when, when the corn, I don't know if y'all know about this, but truck, white trucker's favorite corn 
uh, gets hard real quick and it's used to feed animals and livestock and so forth. The ear's about that big and it, it just, it's, it's just made for that. Well, grow it on the farm, and when you'd, when you'd harvest it, uh, you'd let the ears kind of get dry. And then what Papa would do is he'd go down to the edge of the woods and have a pan full of that corn with the shucks on it. And he'd go down there, and he'd, he'd put the pan down, and he'd beat on the pan. And he'd say, sweet, you know, like that, sweet. And, and I'm sure out in the woods, the hogs would go, bing, you know, like that. And then, and then he'd beat on the side of the can, and it'd, go, and it'd sound like a, you know, like a drum, like bing, bing, bing. And, of course, that probably captured them a little bit more. And then all of a sudden, he'd pick the, take one of those corns up, and he'd tear the shucks. Shh, real, and it was, you know, it, was, it was real dry, and it'd just make a loud sound like, shh, shh, shh. Buddy, here they come. Here they come out of the wood. They'd run out to the edge of the field, and, then, and, and he'd hold, be holding that corn up, and they'd look up like that. And he'd throw about four or five grains down, and he'd take a step back. He'd take about four or five grains, he'd take a step back. And he would walk backwards doing that three or four grains at a time, all the way back to what, to a pen that had been built up near the barn that had what we called a, a slip rail on it, which just meant it was, a, it was a concrete block holding the rail up, the bottom rail up. And when he got those hogs back up there, he'd take what was left in that bucket and he'd throw it out in the middle of that ring and those hogs would run under that rail and then he'd kick the block out and boom, the rail would come down and now they're trapped and they would end up in a bucket of hot water before it was all over with. Now, all I'm saying to you is the devil has hog pens all over this world. And then some of them got flashing lights. Some of them got dynamic stuff going on. And they're very attractive and they're real. But, just, but, 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 but you let that thing attract you. And, and that's the way the devil works, one step at a time. Just be, throw a couple of grains. And then you end up in a bucket of hot water before it's all over with. Uh, that's just a sidebar to the message, all right? That's not really in there. You got that? Did that, did that come through? All right. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have told it. Maybe I shouldn't have told it. <laughs> and I know most people here, when, you, when, when we look at uh, this children growing past the point of, uh, of your ability to control, you want to know, you know, what age does that happen? I mean, how old are we talking about? Well, you know, here, the youngest son, I don't know how old he was. He's probably a young man. Uh, you know, I... I I stayed at home. I went to college, and I lived at home until I got married. Of course, I was 21, so it wasn't a long time. But, but I stayed there as long as I was in college. My parents said, as long as you're in college, you can stay here, you know. And you, you leave school, you leave home, you know, <laughs> get your stuff. But I never expected anything different than that. I don't know why. You know, I just I knew I was going to go out and live. But the but, but point is, I can't tell you the time. I know everybody wants to know, well, is it 18 you're talking about or 21 or 25? What are you talking about? Well, it varies and it differs. But, but, but anyway, as long as they're there, control them, and they'll grow past that. So what do you do when, uh, when the time comes and you can't stop them? What did this dad do? Now, this is going, these are three hard things. I'm telling you they're hard. Nobody said it was going to be easy. But here's what you do. Number one, let them go. When they grow past the point where you can control them and they want to leave home and there's nothing you can do and nothing you can say and there's no reasoning with them and there's no way to stop that desire, then you just got to, you got to, you got to let them go. Now notice, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country. Uh, notice the dad didn't chase him. Dad didn't pursue him. Dad didn't track him and follow him and try to keep up with him and try to talk him back into coming. I mean, from birth, listen, from birth, we have all been preparing our children to leave home. That's what a, being a parent is, is training your children what they need in order to survive in life on their own and to help them understand and prepare for that. So there's going to come a time when that actually happens. And one of the most difficult tasks in parenting is knowing when to let go. So this story that Jesus is telling is, 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 uh, is not comfortable to live with because I know most of us are looking at this passage and saying, man, if my 18-year-old came to me and said, Dad, give me everything that I'm going to get when, I'm, when you die and I'm going to inherit some stuff because I'm ready to leave the house and ready to get out here, I know what you'd say. You'd probably say, kid, you can't even handle your allowance. Get, get back in there before I hurt you, you know. 
So I, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that dad tried to reason with him. I mean, it's not in the passage, but you know dad tried. You know, dad says, son, you need to think about this. Son, you need, what are you going to do in life? How are you going to make a living? What are you going to do? I mean, I'm sure dad tried to reason with the boy, but the boy says, dad, just give me more money. Just, just give me what it is. I, I'm ready to get out of here. And so dad said, okay, here's your stuff. Uh, this is all you're going to get. And the point is, I don't know if you've noticed this, but when, when, when kids get to the point where they no longer want to be under your control and they're not going to stand for that and they're going to have their own way, the tighter you hold, the more they resist. And you know what's going to happen before long? The tighter you hold on, the more pressure is going to build up and there's going to be an explosion one day. And that's not going to be a good thing and uh, could even be a dangerous thing. But just uh, Jesus, I mean, this man, Jesus telling the story. And he says, the dad just, Said, all right, son, get your stuff. First step, hard step. I ain't saying it's easy. You got to let them go. Got to let them go. Number two, step number two. Got to let them make their own mistakes. Got to let them make their own mistakes. Look at this. He journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions in riotous living. He goes to that foreign country, and he wastes everything he's had. And, and it's great at first. It's great at first because he has lots of friends. Because you have lots of friends. You got some money, you got lots of friends. I'm going to tell you that. And you guys have experienced this, right? Uh, yeah, you go out, you got the money, you got all the friends. You got the entourage, and everything works great until what? The money runs out. And I mean, you're thinking, what a waste this is. But rebellion is always a waste, right? So let me ask you, do you, think, do you think that the father knew that his son was going to waste all of his possessions? Probably so. Do you think that that father knew that the son was headed for trouble? Pretty sure he knew it. Then why didn't he stop him? Well, because like, shall I say many of us, he's hard-headed. A better word for that is uh, strong-willed. That's the, that's the new word for it. Strong-willed. And this boy, this boy was determined to learn the hard way. Do you know anybody like this? And don't be pointing at them. It's tacky, all right? Uh, we don't need all that. Just look straight ahead, all right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of us are that way, right? You know what the Bible is? The Bible is God's effort to teach us the easy way, to say to us, this is what you need to do, this is what you don't need to do, this is what to stay away from, this is what to grab on to, and we read it and go, thank you, Lord, that is such great advice, and then we just do it. That's the easy way. I would ask you how many of you have not, how many, how many of you have learned opposite from that? You learn everything the hard way. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard uh, uh, Lawrence say when he steps in it, it goes all the way up to his shoulders. I mean, he, ne he never has an easy miss. It's always terrible when you miss, right? Well, some of you could experience, some of you could testify of that same thing. and say, man, I'm going to tell you, whew, every lesson I've learned, I've learned the hard way in life. Well, do you know that there are some people that are determined to do this? And they only get their convictions through things that are painful in life. And if you are determined to learn life and lessons in life, from pain in life, let me just tell you that the world is just filled with pain. And if you are determined not to learn anything the easy way, but to go your own way and learn things the hard way, you know what the world says to you? Bring it on. It's like the fly paper in the fly, you know, <laughs> fly flying around the fly paper, my fly paper, my fly paper, my fly paper. And then all of a sudden the wind blows and whoosh, old Tanglefoot wraps around the fly. He's stuck on there and the fly paper's going, my fly, my fly. <laughs> That's the way the world just gobbles you up. Dad did the hard thing. Dad pulled back and dad lets the boy make his own mistakes. And I know this is risky and I know it sounds risky. Man, that boy could have you know, got on drugs and he had never got out. That boy could have, somebody could have killed him at one of the clubs and, you know, I mean, he got his camel axe, started driving down the boulevard, uh, let the drop, top drop down and just, you know, enjoyed life till all the money ran out. Man, he was in danger, risky business. But that was the only thing he could learn from. That was the effective way to learn. Do you know that the book of Proverbs chapter 20 verse 30 says that it is only through pain that some people learn lessons? 
And I could say, how many raise your hand? And we'd all go, <laughs> God, I raised my hand. So, got to let them go. I mean, if, look, they're grown past your control. They won't, they won't obey. They're sick of the place. They're sick of you. They're sick of the rules. They won't listen to reason. I got to go. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. All right, let them go. And let them make their own mistakes. Don't follow them around. Don't bail them out. Don't keep trying to prop them up. All you're doing is financing their rebellion. You do know that, right? You are paying for their rebellion against God. Number three, let them reap the consequence of their own choice. This may be the hardest of all. Now, it's not hard if you don't have any resources to, to, to get them, to help them. But if you have the resources and you just got to sit there and watch them suffer, and you got the money in the bank that could, that could bail them out of that, but you just got to sit there and watch. You, got, you, you, got to, you, you could help them uh, get over that right there, but they've, they've chosen that way, and now they, that's the consequence. Because let me tell you what happens if you don't. If you jump in there and bail them out, you know what you're teaching them? You're teaching them they can make bad choices and there are no consequences to bad choices. You are teaching them, hey, I don't, I, don't have to, I don't have to be wise. I don't have to pray about anything. I don't have to be smart about anything. If I get in any trouble, daddy's going to bail me out. So you just teach them how to make poor choices in life because somebody's going to bail them out. Now, if you want them to make wise choices, there has to be some consequences to bad choices, and you've got to sit there and let them suffer the consequences of their bad choice because uh, there, is a, there is a price to rebellion, right? Rebellion has a high price. Look, look, look in verse 14. And when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Now, there didn't have to be a famine in the land. That's just kind of unusual. But it just happened to be one. Uh, just say in the back of your mind, God can do lots of stuff. There just happens to be a famine about the time he spends everything he has. And he began to be in want, and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him in his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no man gave him anything. I guess Galatians 6, 7 is still in the Bible, right? You know what Galatians 6, 7 says? Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the flesh, he shall of the flesh reap rotten flesh. That's a wonderful picture, isn't it? But if he sows to the Spirit, he shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. The consequences of sin. And so this boy goes all the way to the bottom. Do you know that at no time during this whole journey did he have to go to the pig pen? At any point along the way, the boy could have come to himself and turned around and went home. He didn't have to go to the pig pen. Nobody made him go to the pig pen. He had lots of options before he got to the pig pen. He could have listened to somebody that said, boy, you need to go home. You're wasting all your money. Somebody could have said, boy, you know, uh, I know your dad's worried about you. I mean, there could have been lots of opportunities for him to turn around and go home but he, he didn't. He went all the way to the bottom, an empty stomach and an empty life. And the father did the hardest thing that any father will ever do, nothing. Super difficult. Super, super difficult. Hard to do, but, but he did it. You know the boy, you, you know he had to hear about the boy. You know he did. I mean, the older brother seems to have heard about him. So you know dad has to kind of hear. He probably picked up the paper and saw the boy's picture in the paper, you know. Looked like Nick Nolte, you know, on a mug shot. Hair all matted down on this side from last night's debris and hair up on this thing. Looking wild. Charlie Sheen, Mel Gibson. <laughs> Choose your child. <laughs> you know, he had to be, you know, he saw his boy, old Bo's in the newspaper or on uh, Good Morning Mississippi or something, you know, they showed him a little arrested last night, you know. So, stage one fades off into stage two, and stage two happens, and stage two is what every parent's praying for, a reevaluation. The boy, the boy, actually it's a combination of verse 16 and 17. Verse 16, you'll remember the last phrase of verse 16. Verse 16, the last phrase is, and no man gave him anything. Right? He would have filled himself with a pods that the pig swine did eat 
And the last line says, and no man gave him anything. Nobody bailed him out. Nobody petted him and said, oh, you're having a hard time. Take this hundred dollars. It's all I've got, but it's yours because I want you to not suffer like you're suffering. Or he's got a, uh, you're in a divorce situation and you got one parent that wants to bail him out of everything and one parent that wants him to grow up. I mean, that's a tough situation, I'm telling you. I don't have an answer to that. All I'm going to say is somehow, somehow you got to work together because they'll play both ends against the middle every time. I mean, they'll follow the path of least resistance. You say, which parent will they go to? The one that's least spiritual. That's the one they'll go to. Because that's the one that's going to let them do whatever they want to. It's a path of least resistance. It's called humanity. Huh? That's, what we, that's why we need a Savior because we were following the path of least resistance. Come on, man. I mean, that's why we have a Savior. Because that's humanity. That's the nature of humans. But anyway, no man gave him anything. And verse 17, first, last line of 16, no man gave him anything. First line of 17, and he came to himself. And he came to himself. When no man gave him anything, he came to himself, laying in the bottom of the pig pen. He reevaluated. He said, you know, I'm in some circumstances now that have changed the way I think about things. So God has a way, have you ever noticed, about allowing circumstances to deal with us that nothing else can? So because there's no parental intervention, he comes to himself. And, and, and I'm sure that's what every parent in the room is praying for, that, you, that your child will come to himself. So the reevaluation, okay, he came to himself and he said, hey, uh, at daddy's house things are better, and that leads to stage three, which is regret. Regret is not repentance. May I say this again? Regret is not repentance. Regret just means I, I've, I've had a change of mind and I see what's happening and I'm sorry that it's happening. That's regret. A lot of people think regret is repentance. They think, well, I'm going to pray, God, I'm sorry I did it. And that's repentance. That's not repentance. That's regret. Regret, say, uh, he says, this is when, he, when his mind changed. He says, all right, I'm going to rise and I'm going to go to my father. And I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. I want you to notice the change in his attitude. The change in his attitude. You remember in verse 12 when he left home, he said, give me. When he comes back in verse 19, he says, make me. <laughs> yeah, here's what happened. He left home thinking that home was too small for him and not worthy of him. He goes back knowing he's not worthy of home. And he says, Dad, I'm not even worth being a son anymore. I've done horrible things. I've taken your living and squandered it. I, I'm not worth being a son. So I'm not going to even ask you to let me be a son. I'm going to just say, Dad, can I be one of your servants? Can I work for you? Will you hire me? Holy. And, and he's regret. But now that's all that is, is regret. Right now, that's not repentance. That's just simply regret. So reevaluation has led to regret. Now, stage four is repentance. When regret leads to repentance, notice verse 20, and he arose and came to his father. That's repentance. You know what repent means? And I know some of you do because I've said it a bunch of times and you've been here a long time. Some of you may not. Repent means, it's a military word. Repent means about face. Simply about face. You're walking this direction, about face. That's repentance. You're walking away from God, about face. You turn around and walk back toward God. That's repentance. Repentance is not feeling sorry for what you did. It's not saying, I'm stupid. What was I thinking? It's not saying, I'm never going to do that again. That's not repentance. That's regret. Regret leads to repentance if it's true regret. And so this boy arises. He says, I need to go back to daddy's house because how stupid am I? Dad's servants are better treated than I'm being treated, and I'm not a son anymore because I blew it, but I'm going to be a servant. I'm going to ask dad, can I be a servant? And, and, then he, and then when he actually got up off that ground and started walking toward daddy's house instead of walking away from daddy's house, that's repentance. 
And as he's walking towards dad's house, he's practicing his speech. He said, when I get home, I'm going to say, dad, I've sinned against you and heaven in your sight, and I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. And so we enter into stage five, which is the return. And in the return, there are three things that this dad did. Now listen, the return, how, how you react in the return is a really important thing. How you handle it is very important. The father did three things. If they ever do come back, if they ever do reevaluate, which leads to regret, which leads to repentance, if they ever do that, then what happens next when they come back is vital and it's important. And he, the father did three things. Here's what he did. Number one, love them faithfully. I'll show you what I mean. And he arose and he came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, that's an important phrase, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran and kissed him. Now, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it tough love. You can call it uh, strong love. You can call it stubborn love. You can call it whatever you want to call it. But while that boy was still a great way off, he was nasty. Now remember, he just drug up out of a pig pen. He was nasty. He looked like a pig. He was stinking. His hair was up on one side and matted down on the other. His eyes were probably red. His britches were torn up. Didn't have any shoes on his feet. Didn't have any more possessions. And he was nasty and everything else. He was still reflecting everything about the devil's pig pen. And dad loved him. And dad... Didn't wait until he, got, until he got close. Dad ran out there. In other words, dad kept the door open for reconciliation at all times. And to love them faithfully just means don't lock the door on your side. It means, man, I mean, they may look like death. They may act like death. They may stink to high heaven. They may look like that pig being while he was still a great way off. He hadn't got to the house and took a shower and put on clothes and stuff. He's still nasty and stinking and pitiful, and yet dad sees him, and dad says, dad loves him. All right, so you got to love him faithfully. Now, we're not finished yet, okay, so don't bail out and say, what, but, but, but. All right, let's go to the next one, number two. Let me see if I can get it to go there. Isaac's going to have to help me. There it is. Oh, back up. Number two, accept them. Accept them. Now, hang on, and don't get all bent out of shape until I get finished. All right, accept them. He, he threw his arms, verse 20 at the end, he threw his arms, I'm going to read 21 in just a second, but at the end of verse 20 it said, and, and he, he ran to him and he fell on his neck and he embraced him and he, and he, and he, and he kissed him. Uh, he's stinking and, and he's, he's, he's an old stinking nasty self. Um, he, Dad didn't say, boy, you need to get, get, get in there and get cleaned up, boy. You, 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 you nasty, nasty. Now, now, this is what I want to stop and say specifically right here. All right, continued fellowship may have to be negotiated. Okay, now, now I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Acceptance is one thing. Approval is something else. They're two different things. To accept someone means I love you. I accept you. To approve means I love what you do. Now, you may not love what they do at all or what they've done at all. So that approval may be still hanging out down here. But what I'm saying is once they begin to move back towards you, acceptance is necessary. They need to know that you love them. Now, for them to stay back at home or for you to keep having fellowship with them or to enjoy a meal together or to have anything future to do in their life, you may have to negotiate some rules here like, okay, you know, if we're going to be together, you're going to have to quit, you know, uh, 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 cooking crystal meth in your bedroom. Um, I mean, I, that no longer, we no longer can accept that as, as something, you know. And you're gonna, you can't be hanging around with those reprobates you got. They ain't got no teeth in their head down there. You got to get rid of them. They can't come to the house. You know, I mean, you, you have to negotiate what the rules might be in order to keep, 
keep having fellowship with them. But, but you, what this dad did was, before the boy even got cleaned up, I mean, nasty, stinking, still uh, smelling of the world, he, he, he throws his arms around him, he kisses me up, and he, and he accepts him. And I, I love the way he does it. It's very physical. I love that hugging stuff. You know, I'm a hugger and all that. And, and I like it physical. And I know some of you might be saying, well, I'm just not that way. We'll change. You know, I mean, every, your boy needs, or, or whoever it is, they, they might need you to hug them. You know, I mean, express things physically. I, I just think it's better if you do that. And then you see what happens. When the dad does this, look at what happens. This is verse 21. And the son said to him, all right, he's still hugging him. He can't, and then and the poor, poor dad can even get back off of him. The son saying, dad, dad, I got something to say to you. I got a confession to make. I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and, I, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he doesn't even get to the last part. And will you make me a <laughs> He doesn't even get to that part. <laughs> but I, I, all I want you to know, yeah, feed me. All I want you to know is, I want you to see is, notice how easy confession is. Once you know you're accepted. Once dad kissed him and hugged him and did all of that, it was easy for the boy to confess because he was in a kind of a different environment. I mean, come on, you know. Dad loves me. Dad, dad I, I thought dad would, you know, shoot at me. I thought I was going to have to, you know, duck or pucker down here, mm -hmm. well, you know. And, and, and dad, dad threw his arms and dad loves me. And Dad, man, I've sinned against you. How could I ever, you know? And he just, he confesses right there because of the atmosphere. And, and, and the only question was, do you make it easy for people to confess? I mean, you might, do some, might need to do some confession yourself. I mean, you, you may not be totally innocent and everything. So I'm just asking you, do you make it easy for, for, for them to, to confess and to, to deal with you? And, uh, now, here's the third thing. So I, I, I love them faithfully, I accept them, and then once they have repented, and I'm going to say that again, once they have repented, that means they've turned away from whatever and turned back toward the right, back toward whatever is acceptable and good. Once they've repented, forgive them completely. Now, I'm going to show you what that means. What that means is what gets said in verse 22, 23. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his fingers, sandals on his feet. That's just identifying back with the family. Uh, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He's lost and found. And they began to be merry. Now, what I want you to notice is what's not there. What is not there? When the boy comes back and says, Dad, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against God. And I'm, you know, and I'm no more worthy to be called son in your sight. And dad, all right, and then dad does this right here. He just says to the servant, bring the fatty cab, bring the ring, bring the ring. Hey, hey get that fat kid. Uh, get a party going up there. Get this chair. Yeah, tell the boys to get the table out. Yeah, we're going to have steak tonight. Yeah, hot dog, boy. Get the wine vat going or whatever, you know. <laughs> we're going to have a party up in here tonight. Now, what I want you to notice is what was not done. What is not done there that, that many times we want to do? We want to hammer them. Once they repent, we want to say, well, are you sorry for what you did? If I, do you swear on a stack of Bibles that if I let you back in, you'll never do that again? Let's go down to the church. Let's get the preacher. Preacher, come up here. All right, you swear before this preacher you'll never do that. None of that. None of that. When the boy said, Dad, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven and I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, you'll say, Dad said, that's enough for me. And he didn't keep on preaching to him. He didn't keep on hammering him. He didn't try to make him feel guilty more than he, you know, I mean, our boy already felt guilty. What did he say? I'm not worth being your son anymore. I've sinned before you and God. How much more guilty do you want him to be? I mean, are you trying to punish him? Is that what you want to do and hurt him like he hurts you? Grow up. When he comes back, you got to forgive him. And he didn't rub it in. He rubbed it out. Never, as far as I know, he didn't mention it again. There's nothing in the Scripture that said he ever talked about it again. You know why? Because when somebody truly repents, they don't need a sermon. You know what they need? Forgiveness. And guess what? So do we. That's what God has done for us, right? Isn't that what God's done for us? He said if we will confess our sin, he is faithful and just to keep bringing it up. 
drag it up every time he gets a chance, rub our nose in it so we'll get good and sick of it. No, when we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from unrighteousness. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For if I will confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have life everlasting. So what do we need when we come to God with our old stinking sorry pig pen self? We need forgiveness. And that's what God gives us. So, mom and dad, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. And I know you have to have discernment about intentions and everything else. And I'm not trying to be an expert. But I'm just telling you that according to what Jesus shared in this parable, these are the things that are necessary for our hearts to be comforted. Listen, comfort yourself in these things. You don't have control over everything in life. You, you didn't make this happen. You can't fix it either. It's going to have to be a God thing. What, what do I do when I, while, I'm trying to, while I'm waiting for him to reevaluate? Pray. Do you believe in prayer, you guys? Do you believe in prayer? I mean, that, that's not just something you say when you come to church. You really believe that prayer changes things. Prayer changes me. Prayer changes things. He said, if any of you believe, if any two of you agree together, believe as touching heaven, in my name, it shall be done. What he's talking about is get you somebody to pray with that'll, that'll agree with you and pray with you that Bo would come home, that Bo would see God, that Bo would get right with God, that he would love the Lord, he would see himself like he really is. Pray and then commit him to God or her. I keep saying him. You know, I'm generic. Commit him to God, which means you can't do anything with it, but God can do something with it. You can't control what happens, but God's, it's not out of God's control. God has so much stuff he can do. Famines and the like. And then, wait in faith, believing that God, don't jump the gun, is what I'm saying. Believe in faith. Wait in faith. Don't jump out there and try to rescue somebody. Because I'm convinced that if somebody had given this boy an RC Cola and a moon pie, he would have never come home. But because no man gave him anything, he came to himself. And that's what it may take before any rebellion is squelched. And I'm like, look, what discipline is is a breaking of the will. When you discipline your children... You can't just discipline enough to make them mad. You've got you to break their will. Because it's that will that rebels against, against, against c control and discipline. God has to break our will. What happened to this boy is his will got broken. His mind got changed. His heart, his, his whole attitude changed. His, he, he, was, he was a broken man. And that's what it takes for us. So anyway, I, 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 that's enough of that. Won't you stand your feet? All right. <music>